photographers try to tell the story in a very immediate, powerful, provocative way. What I'm doing is studying that subject's movements, their personality, their depth, their gestures. Working for Geographic is the best job in the whole world. It's also the hardest job in the whole world. The intensity you have to live with with the photography. Most people aren't willing to pay the price. You're a little bit like a, a Texas Ranger. You're out there by yourself, on your own, frequently, uh, just doing your thing. It's just a little moment at a time, and you capture it in the box, and then you put it on the page. Once it's there, you've captured something that possibly could never be captured again. Everybody says that you have that I have the best job in the whole world, and um, it's uh, you know I think really for the most part they're right. Jody Cobb is a National Geographic photographer, covering a journey across Europe on the legendary Orient Express. For Cobb, it's just another chapter in a career that's taken her to places most of us only read about. The train manager and all the crew on board wish you a very pleasant journey on board the Venice Saint Orient Express. Thank you. Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour et bienvenue à bord du Venice Saint Orient Express. You're really your own person out there. You're a one-man band. You figure out where you're going to go, what you're going to photograph, who you want to see, um, what you want to see in this country or this place, how you want to tell the story. Telling the story of this train trip will take Cobb only a few days. But some assignments can last for months, usually in less luxurious surroundings. Collectively, National Geographic's photographers shoot nearly 150 stories every year traveling more than a million miles. On any given day, there may be a dozen of them in the field, in as many different countries, searching for unusual subjects, unexpected moments, and memorable images. It's not an easy job. The photographers of National Geographic must try to bring the world, and all that's in it, to the pages of a magazine. From its earliest issues more than a century ago, National Geographic magazine brought the world to its readers, not only with words, but with pictures. Pictures of discovery and exploration, of wild life and wild lands, of people in their customary dress or undress. Photographs were always popular with readers and by 1908, they filled more than half the magazine's pages. Its pioneering editor, Gilbert H. Grosvenor, maintained that the mind must see before it can believe. By the 1920s, the Geographic was sending its photographers all over the world. They sometimes risked their lives to document cultures and customs in faraway places. This was, by all accounts, one of the world's most glamorous professions. What's it like now, half a century later? The image of the National Geographic photographer is just as romantic today as it ever was. It still seems like a dream job. But how does the reality stack up against the dream? The reality of what you get up and do every day till you go to bed that night is far different from, from the perception of it traveling to distant locations, taking a lot of bags, going through customs, getting sick, getting well, hoping, praying. It's miserable conditions or horrible hotel rooms. Worrying about the expenses, worrying about the weather. 
you spend much time arranging and gaining permissions uh, and authorizations and very, very little time shooting. It's loneliness and fatigue and it's assistants who won't show up and it's helicopters that, that develop engine trouble. The plane I was flying in crashed into a lake. It's a bit insane. It's, it's totally abnormal. It's diseases. I've had uh, malaria 12 times. Broken my back, had malaria, been seasick. Uh, they broke into my hotel room at 2 o'clock in the morning and, and robbed me at gunpoint. And it's, you know, all those things. It's, it, uh, God, maybe even the troubles are more glamorous. <laughs> Sometimes, troubles in the field can turn into an advantage. Jim Stanfield was covering the reenactment of an historic flight from England to Australia in a replica of a World War I biplane. On the 29th day of the flight, over the island of Sumatra, disaster struck. Engine failure forced a crash landing. Stanfield and the crew narrowly escaped death, but he was hardly aware of the danger. He was too busy making pictures. I certainly didn't expect to go down in a rice patty, but it led to a portfolio of photographs that we certainly did not expect. You're working a little bit in shock. You're working a little bit on automatic pilot. Uh, I found photographs in that coverage that I didn't remember photographing, even some of the people. So here was a situation that it was a misfortune to the project. It was disconcerting to the pilots, but it did work for me. Nick Nichols specializes in adventure and wildlife photography, and he's no stranger to adversity in the field. But even Nichols was unprepared for the grueling seven months he and his team would spend on assignment in the Indoki rainforest of Central Africa. Indoki is the first time I've ever been to an intact ecosystem. When you get into the Indoki, you realize that you're definitely the outsider, that the, the creatures there are in control. It's just a place for animals and not for humans. The toughest part of my job is oftentimes not taking photographs, but surviving in the environment where I've gone to photograph. The intensity you have to live with, with the photography, most people aren't willing to pay the price. I mean, I teach workshops, so I see students all the time, and they, they really think, wow, you get to wander around the world and take pictures. I say, no, 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 I work. There's a difference in capturing your subject and putting it where you want and having it stand there. The subject is really in control. You're just trying to capture a moment with that subject. Capturing a moment can be a dangerous business, especially if your subject is an elephant with a bad temper. I mean, I'm standing in a stream the elephant's running straight toward me. Really what I'm thinking about is when to run. And so I'm, I push the button at the last possible moment and then I start running. And think, well, I wonder if I got it. I wonder if it's in focus. I wonder if it's properly exposed. And then when you see it, it's just a roaring moment. Field work is more than some people can do. You know, it's 18-hour days. You don't eat, you, don't, you know, and you're away from your family. I mean, we lived in a forest that's got probably the most insects on the planet in it. Not only do they give you disease, they sort of drive you crazy, with biting you all the time, or in your ears, or in your eyes. And there were worms that would get into our feet, and they're called footworms, but I ended up with about 100 of them on my buttocks, which was uh, kind of embarrassing. 
It's not a cushy job. Oh, it didn't load. What? It didn't load. It didn't? Oh, no. no. Okay. In spite of all the hardships, even in a place like Endoki, Nick Nichols manages to create images of classic beauty with a unique flair. His daring and inventive photographs are changing the way we view wildlife. The way I look at natural history is so different than the way it's been looked at in the past. The static nature of photography doesn't do it for me because the world's moving. And I'm very much a product of the 60s and popular culture, so I see with bright colors and I see with a little flash on the camera and, and the edges that the movement creates. The photographers of National Geographic are free to pursue their own styles. And their work is often untraditional, even startling. They're not only journalists, they're artists creating pictures that dazzle as well as inform. William Allard is a veteran geographic photographer who's long been recognized for the distinctive style of his photographs. Like Nichols, Allard pushes his craft to its technical limits often shooting in low light or in unexpected settings. He defies convention both in his style and in his choice of subject. With me, I think it's a certain kind of palette, a certain kind of light. I, lo I love working in limited lighting conditions. I think they're in photography as in painting. It gives you a certain kind of spatial thing you work with. And that's why I don't think, you know, you, I don't think you look at my photographs and say those are snapshots. They can't, you can't make a snapshot at a half a second. I'm not a motion picture person. I'm not a cinematographer. I don't have the element of motion. I don't have sound. So I have to evoke the feeling of movement, perhaps, or the feeling of song. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's trying to put something into that one single image that will evoke the feeling you might get by looking at a sequence of images that tell you about a thing or an event or a place. National Geographic magazine publishes more than a thousand pictures every year. And whether they're traditional in style or more avant-garde, they all must meet the same high standards. So, what makes a great photo? Just ask the photographers themselves. I'd like to think that an ideal National Geographic photograph is one that is clear and sharp and, and abides by the, um, the basic rules of what is a good photograph, that you have a strong center of interest, uh, that it is sharp, and that the composition is good. For me, a great photograph is one that really says something, but is also packaged well, has a nice content, good design, and it says something about life, says something about the human condition, says something about the planet. Because Geographic has faith in their photographers, they give them the time in the field to do deep, thorough, intimate coverages that are comprehensive. And 
Without intimacy, you cannot get the kind of photographs that readers of the Geographic are used to. Close, personal, powerful photographs. Jim Stanfield has shot more than 50 stories for National Geographic during his long career, and he's been honored by his profession. Four times he's been voted Magazine Photographer of the Year. One of Stanfield's specialties is the historical story evoking the life of a lost age, like that of the 16th century Ottoman ruler, Suleiman the Magnificent. In a village market in Turkey, he searched for characters who might somehow personify the people of Suleiman's day. Stanfield looks to the faces of the present to capture the personality of the past. There are probably five or six great faces in this market. But I probably burn two rolls totally on this lady because I believe she has the fiber that I was looking for. She had the strength in her face and body that makes up the personality of what people may have been 400 years ago. And I was just waiting for an expression. What I needed was a smile or a giggle from her that might set her apart. Stanfield invests considerable time and energy in his work in the field, but he brings back more than photographs. How have you been? Working hard. Good. These are some of the rewards that people don't realize. It's not only being reproduced in the magazine, but it's some of the personal contact and it's some of the friendships. Cheap at twice the price. It can be a very lonely life working for the National Geographic and being away eight to nine months out of the year. But if you meet a few people like this, it certainly recharges the batteries. Much of the photographer's time is spent simply finding the right subject to shoot. But he still needs a special talent to forge a personal connection, a bond of trust. Her first name is Fatma. She took a liking to me in Suut during the celebration of the nomads. She has cattle or she has goats <laughs> The most difficult part for a photojournalist is weaving him or herself into the lives of, of the subject and putting the subject at ease. Even though you don't speak the language, I think that they see an awful lot in your eyes. <laughs> I don't think it takes very long for them to realize that I'm very serious about my work. I'm trying to do the very best for myself and for the subject. And uh, I think they get a big kick out of it. The human face speaks to people. It did to me when I was a young man and wanted to be a photographer. Portraits were the most moving thing. I think they continue to be the most moving part of photography. Sometimes there's an absolute immediate emotional thing that happens when you see somebody that you know, A, going to be a wonderful photograph. But B, there's something about them that makes them a wonderful photograph, and that's usually something internal, not just the way they look, but, but their way of relating to the world, of responding to the world, of responding to me as a photographer. And it's, and it's a spark of, of life in, in their eyes, like the child in the um, Vietnamese refugee camp whose eyes and my camera locked at, at that moment, and there was sort of that spark of recognition, that's, that spark of, uh, of communication or something between us. When Lou Massatenta shot a story near Italy's Mount Vesuvius, he would find no faces to respond to his camera, no characters to connect with. 
The ancient Roman town of Herculaneum was buried in a volcanic eruption, and no trace of its citizens had ever been found. It was long believed that they had escaped until archaeologists finally learned the more gruesome truth. In the middle of a summer night in AD 79, a volcanic avalanche descended on Herculaneum. The town's terrified inhabitants were overwhelmed as they tried to flee. Nearly 2,000 years later, the remains of 150 of them were uncovered beneath an ancient beach, and National Geographic dispatched Mazatenta to document the discovery. Now that the victims had been found, his camera would bear witness to their tragedy. I consider this the most important assignment I've ever had because you're, you're dealing with, with history that's just being brought to light at this very moment in time. And, uh, you know, it's me that's here to record it. I think the moment I opened that door of that chamber the first time and walked in and the light was still rather dark and my eyes had to adjust and I saw slowly these skeletons all laying on the floor. And then as I looked closer, um, you could see people hugging them, each other and you realized that this, this was the way they died, that they were just frozen in time. Um, at the moment of their death. And uh, it was very, very um, emotional at first. Lou Mazatenta would spend four months completing his assignment. But taking pictures is only one step in creating an article for the magazine. Back at National Geographic headquarters in Washington, the photographer faces a different kind of challenge. Working with a picture editor, he must review the hundreds of rolls of film shot in the field. Out of thousands of individual frames, only a few dozen will make the cut to be considered for publication. Besides the writer and photographer, the geographic team includes editors, artists, cartographers, computer technicians, all working to bring color, detail, and life to the story. A year or more passes from the time a photographer takes his first pictures until the finished magazine rolls off the presses. And on the cover of this issue, Lou Mazatenda's portrait of a lost world. The cover is a crowning glory. It's, it's the jewel in the crown. I think it makes all of your efforts complete. To have the cover means kind of that you own the issue. I can see that issue from across the room, and I know it's mine. My story's in there. I think it was chosen as a cover because it's a natural photograph. cover. Uh, it's a simple photograph because of the flag is in the picture, the, the stance of the ball player. I think also even the fact he's wearing numeral one, number one. I mean, all these things kind of fall into place, and the light was gorgeous on that, that, that South Texas afternoon. That picture is a result of simply showing up for work on time. I got there, they played the national anthem, the light was very nice, not a difficult picture to make. The writer and I were lost in Dublin, overdue for an appointment in a remote suburb, and we're really racing around Ireland looking for the right road. And we passed these four children with their horse. They were walking in front of a great stone wall and they had this pony and the light was gentle and graceful. Someone saw them who knew them, honked the horn, and they all looked. They looked off camera, the wind blew, and I took the photograph. One frame, one moment, and it catches them unaware. And that's the power of the photograph. 
A lot of times you know it instantly. You know at the very minute that you click the shutter that the picture is there. Um, a lot of other times it's a surprise on the film when you get home. For example, the picture of the women here at the swings and the Saudi women cover. I didn't really realize at the time that was going to be as compelling a picture as it was. You know, I, I saw the light and the movement and the shapes, but I didn't realize how the way her hip line goes would be quite so seductive and to work with the, uh, with the expression in her eyes and that the kid on the swing would be going right at the moment that it was. Um, those things you don't know. You hope for the best. I think a cover needs to be simple, direct, and it has to reach out and grab the reader. This picture was chosen for the cover because it kind of summed up the whole uh, plight of the Afghan people at this time. And there was a very small country. They were invaded by a superpower. Since I made the photograph back in 1984, I don't think a week has gone by in the last 11 years that I haven't gotten a letter or a telephone call asking about her, uh, wanting a print, or wanting to send money to her. The attraction of the, the, why people are drawn to that picture is the look in her eyes. The haunted look is perhaps what is kind of riveting or captivating. Wildlife photography is virtually a trademark of National Geographic. Capturing images of animals in their natural surroundings is a demanding specialty, but the results can entertain, enlighten, and inspire. From the magazine's earliest days, photographs of animals were among the reader's favorites, and geographic photographers were pioneers. On assignment around the world, they created astonishing portraits of creatures both familiar and exotic. But as the number of unexplored wild places dwindled, a new frontier was just being opened. With the development of the aqualung in the 1940s, for the first time, man could explore and photograph the hidden world beneath the sea. An early convert was National Geographic photographer Louis Martin. In the magazine's first large-scale underwater stories, his groundbreaking pictures provided a startling look at the creatures of the deep. Martin's work helped to inspire the next generation of underwater photographers. One of the best is David Dubelet. In his 25 years of working for the Geographic, Dubelet has shot more than three dozen articles. His work keeps him in the field most of the time. I really would like to have a regular life. If I could, I'd like to live in New York, take the elevator downstairs, and swim out into the street and take pictures. Home for dinner every night. Can't do it. I have to go to the ends of the earth. And then when I go to the ends of the earth, then I have to go underwater. Never, never go in the water without a camera. I can barely take a bath without a camera. I might miss something. I figure I've been underwater now, a hundred days a year, since I've been 12, for three hours a day. I don't know what that adds up to, but it's a lot of time. Underwater is half shooting pictures and thinking about pictures. The other half is hunting, finding the stuff. It's a little bit like trail craft, you know, I'm walking through the woods. What's that? What's that sound? What's that thing? Why are these fish doing that? And after a while, you begin to learn 
how the sea works, and it's a very complex, very little understood place. And you've got to find things. Underwater photography, like anything else underwater, requires special training and sophisticated equipment. I knew a guy, he's a French photographer. And he turns to me, you know, smoking a big thick gold wine. He says, uh, David, you know, I, I'm interested only in the image. I am not interested in the equipment of the photography. And I always said to myself, there's a bunch of bullets. Unbelievable, of course. Photography is about seeing. And to see pictures, you need to have equipment. And the equipment not only has got to work, but it's got to be different and new. It provides you with a new look, a new way of looking at something. And underwater, you can't change film. You can't change lenses. You have to have a pile of stuff. For me to do the same job a surface photographer does on land, underwater, when a surface photographer goes along and they have a, some lenses, they have some film, they're going down a strange street in a strange place, they take a lens, they change the lens, they take, they take a roll of film, they do that. To shoot six rolls, I have to have six cameras. And all, each one of them has to have a different lens. And each camera has to have two or three strobes attached to it. So that's like a mound, a mountain of stuff to go off and take a picture of a shrimp or a shark or a shrimp and a shark. And of course, everything has to be lit underwater. It's a blue or green strange world. And it needs that, that bottle of sunlight. And when you do that, it restores colors that are never seen in the real world. And that's what makes underwater photography a challenge. Even for an old hand like Dubelet, some assignments bring a special thrill. A meeting in the sea is a terribly rare thing. For a human to come face to face with any creature is a wondrous experience. And of all the creatures in the sea, stingrays are the most bizarre. To be surrounded by these creatures is not only rare, it's absolutely extraordinary. David Dubelet's unforgettable encounters with wildlife and the resulting photographs more than make up for all his hard work and sacrifices. This is Japan? But he doesn't forget the readers. They too must be enlightened and transported by his experiences. I want somebody who looks at one of my pictures to cross that barrier of the printed page and then go into the sea to become basically one with the ocean, as it were, as corny as it sounds. But if they can sort of let themselves go and rattle around in the frame of the picture and feel the ocean, then it's a successful picture. Total immersion in the world of wildlife is a lot easier on dry land than it is underwater. Making their home near Chobe National Park in Botswana, Beverly Jobert and her husband Derek have the time they need to create award-winning natural history films. And for Beverly, the opportunities for still photography are almost unlimited. I have to totally engulf myself in the subject. And living out in the bush, I obviously have the advantage of a lot of time. Um, I can sit and wait for many hours. And if nothing happens, I don't have the nagging urge of uh, being totally frustrated that I haven't got a shot. We see and learn something different daily out in the bush. It's amazing. And if only I could capture everything that I see, I think I'd have the most unusual African wildlife photography in the world. But it's normally, you know, you get one great shot in a couple of weeks and that's really rewarding. Beverly's rewards, those rare great shots, depend upon the intimate knowledge she's gained during 20 years of living in the bush. 
the most important thing is to become a part of the wilderness. Um, daily, we're out there, we're experiencing and having great thrills and interacting with the animals. We become an animal. I become animalistic, I stalk an animal to be able to get that shot. The one thing I do is I stalk an animal with a camera. So I don't have any uh, means of um, aggression at all. And I actually think that animals do pick that up a lot of the time. Don't spot this one because there are not that many around. They're obviously, it's much harder living in the bush than living in a city. There are a lot of things you have to do, like draw your own water. You can't just turn on a tap and have hot, you know, flowing water. There's an incredible calmness in the bush, and you actually become sort of one with what is happening around you. And your spirit feels, you know, just so great that I don't think I could ever live comfortably in a city. When the sun sets, life in the bush is no longer so calm as the lions begin their hunt. Photographing this nightly drama is one of Beverly Jobert's greatest challenges. You have to habituate the animals so that your presence is not a bother to them at all. And then they will carry on doing whatever they normally would be doing. And especially at night time when we're working with them, obviously a lights could be a bother, but we slowly habituated the lions to the lights and they got so used to it that, uh, it's, that they wouldn't even turn their heads. Even if the lions are willing to accept the Jobert's presence, Capturing a kill on film is by no means certain. It requires patience, persistence, and a good deal of luck. We have one lioness in front of us, and she's going into a low stalk. We've got one on the left, and the rest are coming in directly with us. As this primal scene plays out in front of her, Beverly must find the presence of mind to balance her lights, her cameras, and her emotions. To watch the lions, it took me a long time to accept what they were doing. But when you're behind a camera, you, you kind of forget all emotions around you and you just home in into exactly what is happening in front of you. and. Um, and, and, you, and you capture that moment and hopefully freeze it in time. For Beverly Jobert, freezing a moment on film is the essence of photography. But her success depends upon finding the right moment. Take, for instance, the lion catching the baby elephant. I'd seen that three times in 15 years in Botswana, and never was I you know, able to capture it before. And then two years ago, it happened in front of us. I put my finger on the shutter, and I knew instantly that I got a great shot because I knew it had never been seen before. It was totally unusual, and I just felt that everything had worked out well. Every picture tells a story, and every photographer has a favorite story about a picture. In New Guinea, I swam into this huge school of barracudas. And they began to circle me like a big silver wall coming around like that. And I'm in the middle, and I'm shooting pictures of barracudas. And I'm saying to myself, I am the picture. The picture is me 
in the middle of these barracudas or someone else. So I swam back to the dive boat and I got the captain, Dinah Halstead. I said, you gotta come with me. She says, I'm, you know, I got six other guests I'm cooking. I said, you gotta come. So we jumped in the water, we swam back to the barracudas. They were still there, enormous school, you know, a thousand barracudas. And we swam into it and then they began to circle Dinah. And I dove to the bottom and I said, this is it, this is the picture. And I turned around, I looked up and there were the barracudas perfectly circling her. And I went once and twice. She held out her hand like a ballet dancer. And then they were gone. And that was the picture. I shot the whole roll and I said, we got it. The idea of every picture telling a story, I've always believed that. Like that picture of Jane with the chimp hand. I saw it happening and I didn't know if I could capture it. I basically, I looked over my shoulder and Jane was offering her head to a chimp that would really actually be threatening to kill her because she studied uh, mother-infant behavior so long. She knew exactly how to disarm him with body language. So she was able to offer him her head like that without danger. I'm seeing this out of the corner of my eye and I started walking and trying to clean up the frame while I'm walking. So when I first put the camera to my eye, there were all kinds of disturbing things that didn't make it a magic moment. And I'm just talking to myself, please, 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 and clicking, because you got to keep shooting it just in case it goes away. And there it was for, I think, two frames, but only one that's like that. And then I just, whew. Geographic's mission is to provide its readers with a window on the world, introducing them to lands and peoples they may never visit. Often, however, the photographers must work in places where outsiders are unwelcome. I personally um, like to do the photography of closed worlds, hidden worlds, societies of people that you normally don't get in to see, like the women of Saudi Arabia. Probably 99% of the women I asked to photograph said, said no. Um, the, the situation there is that uh, they had to get permission from their father or their husband or some male guardian. And the punishment for these women uh, to have been photographed and have had their picture appear in a magazine like this is quite something that we in the Western world don't really understand. They could be banished from their families. They could be divorced from their husbands. They could, be, they could lose their passports and their ability to leave the kingdom or to travel. Um, just because, because of this perceived um, taboo against, against being photographed. Bill Allard also specializes in unlocking obscure cultures, both at home and abroad. Over the years, he's provided readers with intimate portraits of religious groups like the Amish, independent loners like cowboys, and even the cloistered world of minor league baseball teams. In the Brazilian state of Rondonia, Allard has entered another hidden community. Here on the fringes of civilization, impoverished farmers are leveling the rainforest in a desperate bid for a better life. But this is more than a story of environmental destruction. It's a tragic story about people. A lot of these people have farmed elsewhere, but they were crowded out by uh, big money, by corporations, big farm operations, and driven in the, in the direction of Rondonia, where they're able to start again with their own land. 
I'm fortunate enough when I work for Geographic that they kind of turn me loose. So I, I can wander down the road and I can respond to the area, to the region, and to the people. To get to the heart of a story, a photographer must sometimes encroach on his subject's privacy. And that can present an ethical dilemma. <laughs> I'm going in here now and I'm going to, you know, I've been taking pictures here for 10 minutes. They've never met me before in their lives and we just <laughs> kind of descend upon them and we, we're intruders. We're always taking and the most, the best you can do, I think, my feeling is because it's, it's undeniable that we are intruding so I think we have to try to do the best we can to make that intrusion worth some merit to them. Sometimes a photographer is able to give something back. For Allard, the chance came after he photographed a young shepherd in Peru. And I was just wandering along the road, as I like to do, and came upon this boy, and he was just sobbing, all broken up in tears. And some driver had come down the road and just kind of smashed through his band of a dozen sheep, killing about half of them. And that band of sheep represented his family's economy, and he was responsible. So here is Eduardo with half his family's economy dead down in a gulch. So they ran the picture. But what I didn't expect and what happened was that people, readers, uh, classrooms of children uh, all over the country, and I, I think some probably from outside the country, responded to that photograph with great generosity and sent in eventually, I think, uh, seven, eight thousand dollars, something like that. And the international organization CARE found the boy and they had a big celebration in which they replaced the boy's sheep and then the rest of the money supposedly went into a fund for Peruvian school children. Here was a situation in which a picture I made made an actual difference in someone's life. In this case, I was no longer guilty of that, taking and not giving. Though their job is simply to document reality, photographers can't help responding to the hardships of their subjects' lives. This seems especially true in Africa, a continent that has suffered centuries of exploitation, but continues to inspire and challenge. Bob Caputo has covered Africa for more than two decades, traveling its length and breadth and gaining remarkable insight into its peoples and their cultures. For Caputo, cultural barriers are made to be broken, and his camera provides a way in. But some stories are almost too painful to photograph. In 1992, he covered the famines that ravaged Somalia, the Sudan, and the other countries of the Horn of Africa. This time he struggled to maintain some distance. The danger in having a camera here in front of your face between you and the subjects is that it becomes a shield. And sometimes it's necessary, especially in, in a situation like the Horn of Africa, because the things that you're making photographs of are so horrifying and so uh, depressing. And I found in, in several situations that there came a time when I, I couldn't do it anymore. I just had to put down the camera. I was too overcome by the emotion and the, the tragedy. I feel like if I'd been able to keep doing my job and keep making photographs when I felt that way, then you stop being human. Caputo has chronicled the joys and the tragedies of the people of Africa. And they've given him far more good memories than bad ones. Invariably, everywhere I go, people are in incredibly generous and hospitable and welcoming. And I've never felt out of place. And I feel a real responsibility to convey accurately their lives. There are all these millions of people who look at National Geographic magazine and 
often, especially in the kinds of places that I go to, um, this may be the only information they get about this place. So I have a real responsibility to try to be accurate and thoughtful and honest about it. Somebody says, boy, you really work hard. I don't consider it working hard because I love it. The hardest part of my profession is if for some reason I can't do it, if I can't work, that's hard. I think we really live in a global world now. And for me, that, that's the geographics function is to keep telling the story of the rest of the world to people, but also in my photographs particularly, I would like for people to get an understanding and appreciation for other people in the world. I feel that I've been incredibly fortunate to be able to go to all these places, meet all these incredible people as a sort of emissary and a intermediary to bring that stuff back for people here. But on a personal level, I've been really lucky to have been able to live like this. One of the things that photography has special to offer is it's a slice. It's just a little moment at a time and you've captured it in the box and then you put it on the page and you can look at it for a long time. It never goes away. The elephant just keeps charging. But that was only at 2 50th of a second back in the swamp. But now it's going to live forever. That's pretty neat.